and the mighty rolling sea, the rolling sea. Wonderful grace, all sufficient for me, for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I see a lot of new faces joining us. Uh, no doubt somebody has invited you today and told you about our special occasion. We welcome you in the name of our Lord Jesus. I also want to welcome the choir that is here with us to celebrate our anniversary. Uh, Elder Eli, the choir director, and also the elder at Kotanesh Presbyterian Church. Lucas, Justin, Bernard, Phoenicia, Valtina, Afi, Josephine. So thank you for so much for joining us. If you will stand with me as we prepare our hearts for worship this morning. Let us sing it with all our heart.
Hearts be gathered. Hearts be gathered. May your spirit work within us. Hearts be gathered. May we glorify your name. Knowing well that as our hearts begin to worship, we'll be blessed because we As we gather, may your spirit work within us. As we gather, may we glorify your name. Knowing well that as our hearts begin to worship, we'll be blessed because we be seated. Well, God be with you this morning. Having lived a transient life as a military uh, person, it's almost second nature for me to worship with new people. And uh, today is a great example of that. And so this morning, whether you are Baptist, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, Evangelical, Catholic, it really doesn't matter what tradition that you grew up with. What matters is that we come together in the name of Jesus Christ this morning and we celebrate the blessing of God upon this church being a light on a small hill for 189 years. We are a church that desires to practice righteousness and grow in holiness together in Christ. And together, today we're joined by the members of uh, Cote Dines Church Choir. Uh, once again, I want to thank you for being with us. Uh, these are the people that I worshipped with for several years and also uh, the church that I served in my final year of my seminary school. And they're people that are very special to me. I'm going to invite our brother Paul to share a brief reflection on this day uh, in light of our anniversary. I am Paul Robinson from the church here and uh, tend to like history, so I've dug around a teeny bit in times past. In uh, 1833, the intendant, Lawrence George Brown, whose name appears on this monument on my right, he uh, was the manager for the Seigneurie de Beauharnois, and the owner of the Seigneurie was over in Scotland and England. And, uh, but he wanted to see a Protestant church established here. So then he went in search of a minister and he found one through the Glasgow Missionary Society in Scotland, uh, uh, Reverend Walter Roach, willing to come and minister here in his, in his mini bring his ministry to Canada. So he came and uh, basically I've about I think May or March, tried out in the area here preaching, got to know uh, both our church and uh, our group here and Shattagy for setting uh, the, the basis for churches in both towns. And uh, to the satisfaction of everyone involved, uh, he was chosen. So a congregation was established here in Beauharnois. And by October, he was established or um, inducted into ministry here and uh, was involved in helping to start churches in Shattagy, which is St. Andrew's now, and likely St. Louis de Gonzague as well, he started, I believe. 
Early services were held in a barn belonging to the seigneurie. The first communion was noted to be in a barn, so we assume the services as well. In 1834, this building was begun on property adjoining the already established uh, Protestant burial grounds. The building here was opened in 1835. It's only had, to my knowledge, one major renovation, lowering of the ceiling and changing of the pews, and uh, a much needed carpet change that's about to be much needed again. In 1838, made it. Uh, there was an uprising that happened here, and Lawrence George Brown and uh, the junior Ellis's, the son of Edward Ellis, was over here with his wife, and they were captured with the goal of getting ammunition and guns. And I show the garden scene because uh, to quelch the rebellion, the um, Highlanders were called in to quelch the rebellion, and they camped in the side yard of the church. Uh, just going to backtrack and say to we have some suggestion that Roach also was captured and imprisoned. Well, basically, I think house arrest in Shattagi uh, because the rebellion included Shattagi and Ganawage. And uh, he was there to perform a wedding, which apparently did not happen uh, at that moment. Anyhow, the only soldier killed is buried in our cemetery here. Uh, with apparently a rather elaborate military burial with uh, bagpipes and the whole thing. People have come and gone in our church, and, and sadly, the once filled uh, pews and sanctuary and the hall down below, this was just the youth and children part, uh, have come and gone and moved away or died or just grown away from the Lord. Uh, so, sadly, they once filled our church. Gladly, they once filled our church. We'd like to see again a revival of faith in our area. Valleyfield having closed there, three English congregations, and Bournois, one or two as well. We remain open as basically the only English congregation this side of Chattagui. And uh, still fulfilling our original purpose uh, ministering the good news of Christ Jesus to a world in need of God's love and God's forgiveness. Our congregation is a mixed group, uh, exemplatory in our ability to adjust to people of varying backgrounds and varying worship styles coming amongst us. Um, we have changed some of our buildings. We've had three halls and three or four different uh, manses that we've used minister residents uh, one after the other. For now, we've proved able to maintain ourselves and keep maintain ownership of our sanctuary, our hall, our manse across the road, as you see here, and uh, also the cemetery in the back that we were deeded at one point. We're a puzzle, actually, as to how we dare to do this and how do we succeed. Well, as the challenges of the future show themselves, we can remember the gospel song, I, many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but we know who holds tomorrow and we know who holds our hands as we go forward and as we trust the Lord to give us many more years to come. Thank you. We know who holds the keys to tomorrow. What an adequate way to end uh, our reflection. Please stand with me for our call to worship. <coughs> our call to worship comes to us from Psalm 24, and it's responsive. Please join me. Lift up your hates, you gates, be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. 
Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. Amen.
know about you, but I, I'm kind of enjoying this afternoon start because this morning I got to go to church with my family. And I was blessed to attend the church where there was two baptisms. And these two ladies shared their heart out about how God freed them from addiction and changed their lives around. And now they were professing Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And I was so blessed. Because no matter how much you attend church, no matter how many times you hear the same message over and over again, that God is alive, that God does great things in your life, unless you experience it in your own life, unless you see God yourself, how are you ever going to believe in this God of the Bible? And so today, as we're worshiping, may you see God. May you feel God. May you hear His voice. May you hear His call. He is the miracle worker. Oh, bear them in 
tu tiens tes promesses Nous mets dans l'éternel, mon Dieu C'est ce que tu es Waymaker Waymaker, miracle worker Promise keeper, light in the darkness My God, that is who you are Waymaker Waymaker, miracle worker Promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 for this last song. bread. 
now invite our brother Eli to come and pray for us. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, for being so good to us, to this church, for 189 years. We thank you for the lives of those who served here before us, the current session of elders, the minister, and all those who sacrificed their time and talents to make the worship in this place possible. May you continue to lead us, Lord. Father, now is the time for us to open your holy scriptures. We pray that your Holy Spirit enables us to understand your word so that we do not leave this place unchanged nor unmoved by, your, by what you have to say to us. We ask, in the, we ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Rose Kelly. Please stand for our scripture reading from Matthew 6, verse 11. Our sister Rose Catalin will read it to us in both English and French. Good morning, all of you. Matthew 6, verse 11. Give us today our daily bread. In French, donne-nous aujourd'hui notre pain quotidien est parfait. L'herbe sèche, la fleur tombe et la parole de Dieu demeure éternellement. Amen. Please be seated. This morning as we open the word of God, I wanted to start with a question that I would like you to give an answer to. I wanted to begin by asking you, what are some ways in which God has answered your prayer for daily bread? What are some instances in your life where this prayer has come true for you? I'll, I'll, share, I'll share an answer first. Um, I shared with a mentor in Ottawa that Pamela and I were struggling in our marriage due to the stresses of life in my final year of seminary school, and he shared it with his session. And then the session decided to do something to bless us. And so they blessed us by paying for six months of daycare so that we could have some time to pray and focus on one another in the mornings. So that was one way in which God answered our prayer for daily bread. I'm wondering if a couple of people could share their experiences of God answering that prayer. If you could be so courageous in this large crowd today. <laughs> Normally it's like a you know, little, little circle of people, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, the choir, <laughs> yes. Choir left so quickly from their church after a full morning of singing, and uh, they got here starving, and the Lord had actually prepared the daily bread already. They were delicious. Yes, yeah, so they, they had their first, uh, <laughs> first meal, and they'll have a second one after this. <laughs> any, any other examples? It doesn't have to be recent. <laughs> I'll have one more contribution. How has God answered your prayer for daily bread? And it doesn't have to be financial. It could be anything, really. Anything that we need in life. What are some of your examples? One more. Yeah. 
If not, then we will continue. <laughs> I, I totally get it. If I was in your shoes, uh, I would probably stay quiet as long as possible. I shared with you last week that I almost failed out of college. Um, and the reason is because I had fallen in love and then God told me to give her up and then we broke up and then uh, I was heartbroken. What I didn't tell you last week is I didn't fail out because God did, did a miracle in my life. So you see, after spending an entire semester from January to April in this heartbroken days, when it came time to the final exams, which were 60 to 100% of my mark, after having spent the whole semester not paying attention, I had absolutely no chance of ever catching up. And I knew my parents would be terribly disappointed in me and ashamed of me. Shame is a big thing in the Korean culture. And I almost thought about just moving to a different country uh, if I were to fail out of RMC. But you know, I did make an honest effort. At least I should be wise with the time that God has given me and try to study. But it was futile. I studied during the day and I went to the chapel at night just to worship God. I never once asked God to help me to pass my exams because that would be irresponsible of me. I got myself in that mess, and so God wasn't going to be the rescue rope. My friends thought I was crazy for closing my books at 10 o'clock at night and going to the chapel, and they were still studying when I got back, and I went straight to bed. I was very much at peace because I had made peace that I was going to completely fail, and it was a very freeing feeling. I was so free. But then several days before the exams began, a miracle happened. And you're not going to believe this. I was studying by myself, looking at dozens and dozens of formulas that I've written out that I'm somehow supposed to use to get an answer that's supposed to plug into the next formula somewhere and then get me to the final answer after 30 minutes of calculation but I had no idea what to do, and these formulas in my head were just floating aimlessly. That's all it was. In my mind, I could see all of these formulas. And as I was studying, these hands came out in my mind. And I saw these hands with my mind. And these hands started grabbing all of the formulas and started to drag them around and pull, arrange them as if it was doing a puzzle. And when the hand had finished its work, I knew it because my head went clear and I understood the entire semester's worth of material at the snap of a finger. I was able to breeze through all of the past exams without any issues. I knew exactly what formula to use, which will lead to what and so on and so forth. And I finished third in my program that year, that year. But all glory to God. Totally a miracle. I have nothing. I, have, I can't say anything at this miracle that I experienced. It was truly astounding that God would even care about my final exams. That he didn't want me to fail out. My dear brothers and sisters, our Father in heaven cares for us in ways that we simply cannot fathom. He cares for us so deeply. And that's what I heard this morning out of the lips of these two ladies who were sharing about how they were dying. They, had a, they were on their deathbed. They had an addiction, all kinds of issues and broken relationships and everything, and this voice that commanded peace came into their hearts and invited them to accept. And they, they came to know that that was Jesus Christ. Let's do a quick recap of the Lord's Prayer because that's where we are right now. So we've established thus far that Jesus is not giving us a verbatim prayer, but rather a way of praying. The words of the Lord's prayers do not contain magical power. The prayer in it of, of themselves is not powerful. That's not the intent of what Jesus was teaching. They express the son's love and affection for his father. 
Jesus loved his father so much that it was his life mission to glorify him. Everything he did and said was completely done according to his father's will. He would do anything, sacrifice anything, and even lay down his life in order to glorify the father. So now after the first two petitions, which was hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We move on to the third petition, the one we like the most in the Lord's Prayer. This is the third teaching point of Jesus for us today. After seeking God, acknowledging God, experiencing his presence and his almighty power, serenading God with your love that you want to glorify him, that you want to see his will done in this world, that you would sacrifice anything for him to be glorified, we then have the wonderful privilege of speaking our needs to our Father in heaven. Once we have established our trust and faithful relationship with God in all things, then we are led to pray for our daily bread. Let me read to you a quote from a preacher named Martin Lloyd-Jones, which will set the tone for what, what I mean, about, what I'm talking about. He says this in a sermon on this passage. Is there not something extraordinary and wonderful about the connection between this request and the previous requests? Is not this one of the most wonderful things in the whole scripture that the God who is the creator and sustainer of the universe, the God who is forming his eternal kingdom, who will usher it in at the end, the God to whom the nations are but as small as dust of the balance, that such a God should be prepared to consider your little needs and mine even down to the minutest details in this matter of daily bread. But that, but that is the teaching of the Lord everywhere. He tells us that even a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without our Father, and that we are much greater value than many sparrows, and that we are a much greater value than many sparrows. He says that the very hairs on your head are all numbered. If we could only grasp this fact, that the almighty Lord of the universe is interested in every part and portion of of us. That is the miracle of scripture. That we can go from the, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and then you can say, give us today our daily bread. This is the miracle of redemption. That is the whole meaning of incarnation, which tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ takes hold of us here on earth and links us and joins us to God in heaven. I want you to let that truth sink deep into your soul today. God, the creator, is concerned with your very need down to the minute detail of every strand of hair. Let that sink into your soul. The one who is worthy of all praise, the one whose name we are called to glorify, he cares for us, not in a gen gen generic way, but in a deeply intimate and personal way. We gather at church and worship because we want to see that what the Bible says about God is real for my life, and we want to see God working in our lives and experience that God is true as he was back then to these people, and he is still true to this day in our own lives. And not even a passing thought escapes God's ears. But we have a problem within the church the church has nurtured and coddled the Christian into believing that life is all about extracting the most value out of God. That God is a vending machine of blessings. Good deeds in, blessings out. Good deeds in, blessings out. So many Christians complain when prayers are not answered. We are so entitled. We act like God owes us. We're quick to judge God and throw our hands up saying, how come you won't answer this prayer, God? How come you won't give this to me? How come? 
God, you were supposed to answer that prayer last month. You're late again. Where are you? Where's my rent? Such an immature attitude opens the door to bitterness, resentment, and unhappiness. It bears bad fruits because the seeds were bad to begin with. You see, the third petition of the Lord's Prayer proceeds after the first two. We have to understand that give us today our daily bread is grounded and not separate from hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It's a unified prayer, not seven random prayers put into one. In our worship of God, our faith will become distorted and twisted if we have a habit of skipping ahead to the third petition. The first two steps of prayer are God's safeguard against our own pride and ego. We often struggle in our faith and spin our tires because of our what's in it for me, society, culture, and attitude. It infiltrates our hearts and souls' lies about God. The enemy whispers nonsense into our hearts. If God loved you, he wouldn't let you suffer like that. If God cared about you, then he wouldn't let you miss your rent payment or let you get evicted. If God is God, why would he let such a terrible thing happen to you? So on and so forth. And like a spiritual toddler, we cannot see beyond the me boundary. It's all about me. But Jesus taught us to first look up at God in prayer before we look down on ourselves and around to others. We have to be grounded in who God is in worship and in prayer and experience his majestic presence and power and awesomeness and be in awe and wonder and reverent of God, then sing him, then sing our love songs to him and worship him and praise him, which brings us then to the prayer of our daily need after that grounding. There is a very important real life Old Testament story that, that, that I believe gives us very important context to understanding what daily bread actually means. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. And if the picture's up there, then I don't need to ask you what it reminds you of. In Exodus, when God chose Moses and freed the Israelites out of Egypt, immediately they began complaining. They were in the desert, in the wilderness, it was hot, it was dry, there wasn't much to eat, and so naturally they began to grumble. I've marched in extreme heat. I've walked through the wilderness. It really is miserable. And you can become a real miserable person under extreme conditions. And I've experienced that myself. So I no longer judge the Israelites. I would have been right there with them. I would have been the loudest complainer out of that group. In Exodus 16, 2-3, it says, In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around with pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us out into the desert to starve this entire assembly to death. You see, God forced them into a corner for a reason. It was by his design that he had led them out into the desert because he was going to forge a nation called the chosen people of God. They might have been chosen, but their lives, their hearts, their lifestyles, their prayers, their worship of God had not yet reflected their chosen status. And so God was going to refine them in the desert for 40 years. 40 years, the whole assembly wandered in the desert in circles. And every morning they had to gather manna flakes to survive. For 40 years, it was a daily task. No exception. Early in the morning, 
before the heat of the sun would melt it all away, they had to gather as a, as, as a whole congregation. They had to go out. It was a matter of survival. But they, only had, they had to gather only enough for the day because the rest would be all rotten if you tried to store it. Except on the Sabbath when God allowed them to gather double portion. Would, just think about it. If this story is true, why would the manna that falls on Friday be different from the manna that falls on Thursday? Did God change the molecular state of the manna? I don't know. <laughs> but I know this. Everything happened according to what God said. And you know what God was trying to teach them? Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's what they were learning for 40 years. That's what God was teaching his people for 40 years. And that's what he's been trying to teach you and me for the, long, for the full, whole time that you've na- known God and confessed that Jesus is Lord. We do not live on bread alone. That is why God was giving them the bread so they can survive and they can see when God says, I will rain down manna from heaven, he will do it. And when God says, gather double portion the day before the Sabbath, then you listen because there really is no manna the next day. They learn to live on the word of God. And this is why this story is so relevant to the prayer of daily bread. Because Jesus' listeners are Jewish people, are people that take pride in their heritage as descendants of Abraham. They know this story about manna inside and out. The minute they hear bread, the minute they hear words that make them think about that, they go back to their identity as the people of the desert who ate the manna from heaven. God humbled them and fed them manna, which you did not know, nor your fathers knew, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone. So in the desert every day, as they gather manna, they meditated on the reality that God was the provider for all of their needs. They watched the bread rain down from heaven. They gathered it together. They cooked it and ate it and experienced its nourishment. God cared and loved his people so much that he prevented their sandals and their clothes from being worn out in the desert because there was no malls there. There was no clothing stores there. They didn't even have time to farm anything or gather raw materials to make clothes. God kept them marching relentlessly for 40 years, every day, every day, but he met their every need in the wilderness. And God was saying to them this, and he's saying this to you today. You can trust in me. I myself will provide. I am the provider. I am your father. Man does not live on bread alone, but by the promise that comes from my mouth. You can trust in me. This world would have you believe that you are a self-made man or a self-made woman. I hear this all the time on television and TV shows in whatever media I go on, where people are being interviewed because they're rich and famous, and inevitably the word self-made comes up. The world says, good job, you did it all by yourself. By the sweat of your own brow, you sowed, you watered, you gave it sunlight, and you made it grow. It's your kingdom. It's your business. It's your empire. It's your legacy. It's all yours. Your name's on it. The license plate says, the boss, you did this. You deserve all the credit. But I'm here to tell you that is a lie. Today was never guaranteed if it weren't for God's coming grace. Our very breath, the thousands that you have silently taken since this service began, every single breath came from God's blessing. The fact that you were healthy enough to walk over here or drive over here and come to worship is grace upon grace. 
Nothing we do ever is our own accomplishment. That is foolishness of this world. We are not self-made people. We are wonderfully and fearfully made by God in his image. We do not succeed because of our talents, our gifts, or because of our hard work. We do not live by the sweat of our own brows. We live by the grace of God, and that's it. God said, I shall rain down bread from heaven. And then Jesus came, and then he said, I am that bread of life. He was the bread that was foreshadowed in Exodus. The manna, they ate it every day, but the next day they were hungry again and they had to eat again. And the Israelites all thought there was going to be a temporary Messiah, a man-made solution to their problems, but God had an eternal, once and for all, finished salvation and redemption plan in mind through Christ Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall never hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. You've probably eaten breakfast today, but you probably, if you didn't, maybe you ate supper last night. And I bet you were hungry again today. And yet Jesus said, I am the bread, and if you eat of me, you will never hunger and you will never thirst. So clearly, he's talking about something including but deeper than physical hunger. My dear brothers and sisters, God provides for our essential needs and answers our prayers for daily bread to open our eyes to the eternal need and eternal hunger that is built into our spiritual DNA. God made every single human being to have this longing for God. And if any man or woman looks deep within their hearts, they cannot deny it. You may deny it to my face. You may deny it to someone else. You may say, I don't need God, but you will stand before God one day and you will not be able to deny that there were ample opportunity for you to say, God, I need you. God meets our hunger, our physical, our daily needs in order to point us to our eternal hunger and need of Christ. And so if our God's ultimate goal is for you to never hunger again, for you to live in eternity with him as chosen people, then sometimes he will allow us to go without in this life. And sometimes he will allow us to experience pain and great trials. Sometimes he will remind us that we are nothing without his protection and providence in life. God can and will humble us so that we may yield to Christ. This is the truth of the believer's life. Everything works for the good of the believer. A lot of people like to use that. But everything works for the good of the believer, and that good is to know God. The good that Bible talks about is not abundance, wealth, riches, fame, glory, clout, whatever you want to think about, influence. The good that Bible talks about the abundant life that Jesus talks about is always about the eternal perspective that this life is not the end that this life is very important because we need to make a decision whether or not we're going to accept God's version of reality or this version of reality so I want to conclude today by saying that we did not end up here by accident I want you to know that this body of Christ is still here because of God. Witnessing and testifying of 189 years of God's faithful pro pro provisions. And as we look forward to tomorrow, as our elder Paul shared, the keys are in God's hand. The keys to tomorrow in God's hand. 
And as we look forward to tomorrow, we are grateful and thankful for the miracles of yesterday and today from God. And we continue to believe and trust in God for tomorrow. And as a church, as we pray and discern the next steps, as we pray about tomorrow, let us focus on sharing the living bread from heaven. Let us be few, but let us be mighty. Ma numbers matter not. What matters is your heart and love towards God. God can use this church. God can use you in ways that you cannot even imagine or fathom of doing. And no doubt there will be great challenges in your life as a Christian. No doubt there will be relational needs, physical needs, financial needs, and spiritual needs. But I have no doubt that God will defy our expectations, that God will show up in great and amazing ways if we would believe and trust in him, and that God will be glorified through us, and that we will experience what it means to live by the words that come from God's mouth. So let us pray, persevere, and experience the joy of living by the word of God. Let us pray, Lord, give us today our daily bread so that I may give you all the glory. And our Lord shall say to us, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall never hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. In this life you will suffer, but in the next, all tears will be wiped away. In this life, the suffering of this life cannot compare to the glory that you will have in the next. So fear not, I am with you always. I am with you, I am with you. Take courage, have courage, I am with you. Cry out to me for your daily bread and see that I am a good, good God, that I am a good Father. May we cry out to God for our daily bread. Let us pray. Lord, we come to you with thanksgiving and words of prayer for our church. You're, you are the one responsible for keeping us here today. You are the one responsible for allowing us to come and gather as a church. You created the world in beauty. And when we pay attention, all of creation sings of your majesty. All of creation was designed to reflect your glory. It's just that we have our blinders on and we choose to ignore what is obvious to, in, in our, in, to our hearts. Your glory can be seen in the colors of fall. We thank you for this upcoming season of darkness and hibernation as nature prepares to re rebirth with new clothes and new life in spring. You led your people by fire and cloud and now you lead us by your own holy presence who lives within us. Wherever we go, no matter what circumstances, you are present with us always. You sent your son to the world for its salvation. You rained the everlasting bread of life from heaven to us. And we tasted and we have tasted and seen that you are good. Lord, we thank you because you hear our prayers because you pr your promise always you promise to be always with be with us because your kingdom is coming because you alone bring healing you alone can bring peace to our present chaos and war and rumors of nuclear war and rumors of catastrophic climate events you alone can conquer evil and we celebrate and remember the story of your sustaining ministry here at St. Edward's Church for the past 189 years. We look forward to your good, pleasing, and perfect will for this body of Christ. 
We look forward to discerning your voice and direction as a church in the year to come. We look forward to new life, new ministries, and new relationships. We look forward to restoration of broken relationships, children coming back to the Lord, and the sick being healed, and the oppressed being vindicated by you. And for the many prayers that we do not mention aloud, we join our voices in the prayer that our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I now invite the Kotanesh Choir to sing us an offertory song, Jesus Christ, the Bread of Life. Qui croit en toi n'aura jamais
Each of you must give as you've made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let us present our offerings to God in prayer. Lord God, we bless you for all of your many gifts to us. We return these gifts as a token of our gratitude, longing for the conviction and strength to offer our whole lives in your service. We pray especially for your blessing on Kotinesh Church as they continue to seek your will for them. Grant them the wisdom and discernment to be faithful ambassadors of Christ. We pray that they will be encouraged in their work and that their ministry may bear rich fruits in your kingdom. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand with me as we sing a closing hymn together. Most likely, you may not, may not know the song, so I've asked the choir to perform it for you, and then we're going to sing it through once. But I wanted to um, tell you the origin of the song. The song is called, God Be With You Till We Meet Again. And this hymn was written as a way of saying goodbye to one another at the end of service by a church in the 1800s. But it was based on the origin of the word, goodbye. You see, if you look at the screen, you'll see that the word, that's the original spelling of the greeting, goodbye, God be. You see, the original word is God be with ye. And over time, that was changed and adopted as a common greeting to be goodbye. And so today, as we, we're gonna, we will properly say goodbye by, to one another by singing God be with you. And the choir will sing it now for you. And we will all sing it together. this as you receive God's <coughs> benediction and blessing for you as you go forth. Go forth remembering who you are and to whom you belong. As you have been fed by the living bread, go feed the hungry. As you have been set free, go to the imprisoned. As you have received, give. And as you have heard, proclaim. And now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen.
couple of announcements before we listen to a little bit more music from the choir. Uh, I wanted to remind you that there is fellowship downstairs today, uh, but there's a special event, a reoccurring event that our church will be hosting in partnership with MWCN, Bohar Noir. We'll be hosting a English conversation class starting Monday, the October 24th from 4 to 6 p.m. So if you would like to learn English and talk with other like-minded people and English-speaking people, please come and join us on Mondays. And while we're all here today, uh, we're going to take a group photo after the choir has finished the last song. So please come up to the front and form a line. I won't keep you very long. We'll just take one or two pictures and then we'll go downstairs for fellowship. Yeah, we're all down here. 